Okay, I'm on, huh? Hey guys, how you doing? I told you I'd see you next year. God willing. What's up, Revelation 2213? How how you doing, everyone? Vine, what's up, my brother? Oh, hello, yeah, my sheikh. I like this guy, Tony Elma. Keeps calling me Yeah, my sheikh. You know what's ironic? I saw a comment by I think Radioactive. Let me see if I can find that comment. It's kind of ironic. Yeah, Radioactive. Hello. Didn't think Kron was Sam's specialty specialty subject. That's kind of ironic, right? Radioactive is probably one of the few people that I've heard say that because typically most people identify me as an apologist refuting Islam, right? So it's ironic. Thank you, Alex. I pray in Jesus' name that he makes me holier, more righteous, more pure, more in love with Jesus Christ by living for him and crucifying my flesh, flesh in the power of the Holy Spirit of the living God in Jesus' name. May the Lord Jesus loosen my tongue and sanctify all of us, sanctify our hearts, the desires of our hearts, our motives, sanctify us wholly and completely, sanctify our bodies, our souls, and spirits by his spirit, washing us in the blood of Jesus, the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the Father's beloved Son, to be pure, pure and holy in his sight, in Jesus' name. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yeah, I don't know if radioactive is still on. Yeah, thank you, Vine. Even though ecumenical in a good sense, a biblicist who tries to be faithful to Scripture and honest to Scripture and honest to the God of the Scriptures and speak truth even if no one particular denomination would accept me. Yeah, you know why I say that's ironic, radioactive? All my apologetics <laughs> life, I hear people saying, Sam Shamoon, Christian apologist against Islam. Very rarely do people identify me as a Bible teacher quote-unquote, a Christian theologian. So it was kind of funny, right, that you would say, I didn't know that the Quran is Sam's specialty, which actually blesses me because I really don't want to be identified as simply a Christian apologist to Muslims or a Christian apologist against Islam. I really want to be known as someone who seeks to know the Holy Bible, the true Word of God, inspired by the Spirit, preserved by the Spirit, seek to understand it, seek to teach others what the Bible says concerning the core doctrines of the Christian faith, and then desire by the power of the Holy Spirit to live it out for the glory of Jesus Christ. But I need to start tackling Islam on my YouTube channel. Also, I want to start tackling the cults like Joe's Witnesses. I already have videos on Joe's Witnesses. And I will still focus on the core doctrines of the Christian faith, if the Lord Jesus is pleased to use me, anoint me by his spirit, fill me with his spirit, grant me the holiness to delight his heart and crucify my flesh and save me from giving into my flesh, but to fight my flesh and conquer it by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. And may the Lord Jesus forgive me and forgive us when we fail to do so, but to never justify doing it and walk in the life and the power and the love the wisdom and knowledge and the fruit that comes from the Holy Spirit of the living God. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Have your way. Save me from error, even as I speak about Islam. Anoint me by the Holy Spirit, Father. Anoint me by your Spirit, Lord Jesus. Anoint me, <clears throat> Holy Spirit of the living God, the Spirit of the Father and the Son, to speak truth clearly, even when speaking about Islam. And to be used, Holy Spirit, to bless your church, the spiritual body of the risen Lord of glory, Jesus Christ. Enable your church, embolden your church, empower your church to know this information, to destroy the lies of Islam and every other worldview that seeks to deny the glory of Jesus Christ. So that every Muslim knee will eventually bow and every Muslim tongue will eventually confess Jesus Christ as the Father's beloved Son, Yahovah in the flesh, one with the Father and the Spirit. In Jesus' name, we love you, Father, Son, and Spirit. So, Lord willing, I may do two sessions, depending how long this session takes, right? So pray that I'm filled with the Spirit to bless you and that we're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ and the Lord Jesus forgives us and forgives me when we succumb to the flesh. May he give us victory not to succumb to the flesh. 
I'm probably going to do two sessions. I'll do a session now on the Quran. And if this session doesn't take too long, then I'm going to go back and do, what was it? Part four now? Yes, part four, right? We already did three parts on the glory of Jesus Christ. No, no, we did two parts, right? I have to go back and see my channel. Maybe one of you can check. I think, I know definitely we did two parts on whose glory did Isaiah see according to John 12, 37 and 41. Even though we read John 12, 36 to 42, right? <clears throat> it really, the passages that John quotes from is found in John 12, 37 to 41. He quotes Isaiah 53, verse 1, and Isaiah 6, 10. But I looked at 36 and 42 to solidify the fact that all the pronouns there, the him and the his, refer to the Lord Jesus Christ. So then when John says in John 12, 41, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. There is no doubt contextually, both from the verses before and the verse immediately after 41, the his and the him is the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So Lord willing, I'm going to do a part three on that in Jesus' name. Maybe I'll do it right after this. If this doesn't take me two hours, then I will do another session if you guys are up for it. But pray the regular show up. Pray more new faces show up for this new year. We bring more people in to learn this material, absorb it, and use it in the power of the Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus Christ and bring Muslims to the feet of Jesus because Jesus died to save them as well. Right. With that said, let me give you the article that I just posted yesterday for this particular series. Here it is, part one. So folks, do me a favor, click on that link, save that article, because this is the outline that I'll be following by the grace of the Lord Jesus as the Holy Spirit anoints this session and enables me to speak to the matter clearly and to bless you and be used of the Spirit to embolden you, to show Muslims that the Quran is not the Word of God, but the Bible is, right? So there's the link. This is what I'll be using, Lord Jesus willing. So is everyone with me? There are various ways in which you can prove that the Quran is not the word of the true God, right? So if you're with me, let's start the show. Rock and roll, baby. Right? As Holy Spirit enables me to recall all these facts correctly. Please, Holy Spirit, we need you. Please, Holy Spirit, sanctify us and purify us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Hey, admins, we got another dog here. You want to send him on his merry way? And I know you know what dog I'm talking about. This is going to be good. Excellent topics always. Okay. Pray for more people to show up. All right. You don't see him, Tarot reading, this barking dog, this rabid dog. You don't see it? Tarot, even the name, Tarot. Right. Anyway, okay, folks. Uh, now here's the dilemma. I know Protestant and first and last are able to post Quranic verses, but you know what? Yep, the buffering again. The buffering again. Dum -ba -dum -ba -dum -ba -dum. Sorry, guys. Remember, I'm still at my brother's place. And because I'm at my brother's place, the internet connection is not the best. So it's going to buffer. So, guys, forgive me for all these setbacks and these technical issues. We're trust Holy Spirit that the buffering will stay at a minimum by the grace of the Holy Spirit. So in Jesus' name. All right. In Jesus' name, Father, Holy Spirit. Here's the link again. What I'm going to do is maybe Protestant. I don't know if you want to post because I quote a slew of Quranic versions, English versions of the Quran. So it's going to be easier if I just read from my article. But in the next session, God willing, when I talk about the glory that Isaiah saw, when he saw Jehovah in visible shape, in visible form, that was actually Jesus Christ in his preeminent existence. <clears throat> then there you can... Obviously, post Bible verses. So, guys, if you're ready, <clears throat> there are various ways in which you can show that the Quran is not the word of God. The Quran itself gives you one challenge. It gives you a challenge, criterion. The Quran itself presents a challenge 
it, it gives you various criteria, but one particular criterion is in chapter 4, verse 82. So pray for me to represent the Quran accurately because you don't need to misrepresent the Quran. <clears throat> the Quran, because it's a false book produced by the devil or an evil spirit that inspired Muhammad, <clears throat> cannot help but contradict itself, cannot help but self-destruct. And it's one of the greatest proofs that Muhammad is a fraud. In chapter 4, verse 82, here is a criterion that the author or authors of the Quran give to test whether the Quran is from God or not. So let's read chapter 4, verse 82. Do they not then meditate on the Quran? Do they not ponder on the Quran? And if, and if it were from any other than Allah, they would have found in it many a discrepancy. Do you see the criterion given here? The, the Quran challenges you to meditate upon the Quran, ponder on the Quran carefully, and if you're able to find many discrepancies, then surely it cannot be from Allah, which the Quran assumes is the true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? Everyone see that criterion? You guys see it? <clears throat> now let's read Yusuf Ali. Now this is not in my article, but I just want to mention it. We're going to go into the heart of the matter. Because I'm going to teach you how not to witness the Muslims and how to witness the Muslims. How not to witness and how to witness the Muslims, okay? Yusuf Ali, thank Protestant Believer for helping me to help you for the glory of Jesus Christ. If I can keep this within an hour, less than two hours, I'll do another session on the glory of Jesus Christ because that's more important. But still, we need to expose Islam and destroy it by the power of the triune God to strengthen the church and witnessing to Muslims so that Muslims get saved and fall in love with Jesus, the Son of God. Now, 482 Yusuf Ali. Do they not consider the Quran with care? Had it been from other than Allah, they would surely have found therein much discrepancy. Now notice the criterion given by the Quran. You want proof the Quran is not from Allah? Find many discrepancies. Find many errors. Find many contradictions, right? Because if it's from Allah, it'll have no contradictions. But if it's from other than Allah, guaranteed that it'll have many contradictions. Now even this passage is incoherent Babel. The Quran is an incoherent, unintelligible piece of Babel. The Quran is one of the greatest proofs that Muhammad is a fraud, was not inspired by the true God, but was inspired by an evil spirit, if not the devil himself. Why do I say that? Notice again what this passage says. Did you know if I find few contradictions, that doesn't falsify the claim of the passage? The passage says, had it been from other than Allah, you'll find many contradictions. Implication, even if you find few errors, one error, a couple of errors, that still doesn't disqualify it from being from Allah because the criterion says you must find many errors, not just a few or a couple or one. Do you see how incoherent, unintelligible this passage is? In other words, the Quran is assuming, yeah, even Allah can make an error or two. Yes, perhaps Allah made a mistake or two. Maybe a few errors. But here's the thing. Though Allah may be prone to making an error or two, making a mistake or two, Allah is not capable of making many errors, making many mistakes. You see how silly this passage is? See, Andrew Martin got it, right? Andrew, you saw how this passage itself is proof that the Quran is incoherent babble, a fraud proving that Muhammad wasn't inspired by the true God. Did you catch it? So pray the Spirit fills me with wisdom so we can unpack the errors, the silliness, the incoherence, the wickedness, the immorality of this, of this scripture. Right? Let's read it again. In case you guys are doubting what I'm saying, let's read it again. Chapter 4, verse 82. Let's read it again. One more time. Read it for yourselves. In Arabic and English, it's basically the same. Guys, read it. Look. Had it been from other than Allah, then they surely have found there much discrepancy. Implication. Even one or two errors does not disqualify it from being from Allah. 
What disqualifies it from being from Allah is if you find many errors, much discrepancies. Implication, even the author or authors of the Quran knew that Allah was capable and prone to making an error or two. We're not saying Allah won't make an error or two or a mistake or two. We grant that he's capable of making a few mistakes, but he can't make much, many mistakes. Did you catch it before I move on to the next point? Is it sinking in by the power of the Holy Spirit as he illuminates, illuminates me and saves me from error and uses me to illuminate you for the glory of Jesus? Because we need the Holy Spirit. We depend on the Holy Spirit. We trust in the Holy Spirit for everything. Right? But then it gets even worse. It gets even worse. Watch here. Let's look at the passage one more time. Oh, Craig, you haven't seen anything yet. This is why Craig Smith, most people associate me with Islam. And again, I'm not trying to boast. May the Lord Jesus destroy my flesh, save me from my flesh, and destroy my pride and arrogance. You'll have Christian apologists saying this, right? And I'm not trying to say this to praise myself or to sell, you know, sell myself. Even David Wood, you'll hear him say, and he said it in my presence and even when I'm not around, that he believes that God has raised me up to be the greatest apologist against Islam in 1,400 years. I don't believe that, obviously, but praise God for that favor, that grace. Praise the Lord Jesus for his love upon me, his love for me, to give me that kind of favor in the eyes of other apologists, right? So... But I don't want to be known for that. Let me just be clear. I don't want to be known simply for refuting Islam. I want to be known, and this is my prayer, and I ask the Holy Spirit to grant me this. I want to be known as a man who was in love with Jesus and that his badge of honor is that he is the slave of Jesus Christ, who belongs to Jesus Christ, and that Jesus Christ is his very love and life, even though I fail him and I love him imperfectly. That's what I want to be known for. Because I exist for Jesus. I don't exist to refute Islam. I exist to love Jesus, to glorify Jesus, to be in love with Jesus and give him the glory that he deserves. And every one of you exists for that very reason. We do not exist to destroy Islam or atheism or the cults. We exist to be in love with Jesus. Because true meaning of life, the only true meaning of life, the only meaning of life is to be in love with the one for whom you exist. Right? That's, that's what I want to be known for. Now, 482. Let's look at 482 again. 482. This first in itself is proof that the Quran cannot be from the true God. Okay? Here, let's reread re it. Let's reread it. Let's reread it, guys. Do they not consider the crown with care? Had it been from other than Allah, they would surely have found they're in much discrepancy. If anyone here knows anything about logic or philosophy, and David Wood, though he's a dictator, he is a gift to the church of Jesus Christ. David Wood is a genius. David Wood has the mind of a general. He's like General Patton. He was designed by God for spiritual combat and warfare, he is a genius when it comes to strategizing, right? And he's a top-notch philosopher and logician. Anyone who knows logic will see the error just reading it. David Wood can see it with his eyes closed. Do you see the other mistake in the formulation of this passage? Let me repeat it. Had it been from other than Allah, if this book was produced by someone other than Allah, then surely it would have many, much errors in it. You know what that means? Let me bring out the implication, and Andrew should see this. The implication is only God is able to write a book that is flawless and has no mistakes. See, Andrew saw it. In other words, no one else besides God is able to write a book that has no errors. Therefore, any book that you pick up on math that has no errors that can't be from a human being. It must be from God. Because the formulation of this passage is, if this Quran was produced by someone other than Allah, then it would contain 
much discre discrepancies. Implication, creatures are incapable of writing books that are free of errors. So anytime you pick up any book that has no errors, that must have been written by God or that person must have been inspired by God. Do you see how many errors in this one passage? Do you see how many errors in this one passage? So you know what you do? You pick up a book, a math book, or a science book that describes scientific phenomena and say, Muslims, try to point a discrepancy in this book or these books. And if you find no discrepancies, and according to the Quran, these books were sent down from Allah from above the seven heavens. Did you guys catch the gross errors of this just one of the of just this one passage? Just, this this one passage, just this passage by itself is enough to destroy the fraud of Muhammad. Do you guys catch it or no? And uh, guys, uh, guys, I know I speak too fast, so bear with me if I keep repeating myself. It's not because I'm trying to be disrespectful and talk down to you. It's because I know I speak fast, so <clears throat> I've gotten into the habit from teaching all these years to repeat the same point more than once so that I don't speak too fast, I don't lose you, and it sinks in by the grace of God's Spirit. Do you see how many errors... In this one verse, just this verse itself contained two gross errors. Yep. Yeah. So here we have a Mohammedan who's a stone uh, smoocher, and he says, my interpretation is wrong. See? Notice what he said. Notice. No, no, no. Don't block him yet. Hold on, Angela. My goodness, you're quick to the trigger. I was going to use him as a scapegoat. Did you see what he said? Go to the tafsir. So now he's going to now set himself up and now destroy the Quran even further. Because notice what he just told me. He told me, your interpretation's wrong. Go to the tafsir. So notice that he indirectly admits the Quran is incoherent, unintelligible babble. So you need outside sources, uninspired, fallible human beings to explain what's supposed to be the perfect eternal speech of his God. Wow. Did you catch it? You guys see what he just did? Instead of refuting me just by using the Quran, instead of refuting me by appealing to the Quran, he says, your interpretation is wrong. Go to the tafsir. Go to the commentary. Oh, so you need the exposition of uninspired, imperfect, fallible human beings to make sense out of this incoherent, unintelligible babble that you believe is the perfect speech of your omniscient deity. So your omniscient deity was incapable of speaking clearly enough so that now we need uninspired, imperfect, fallible expositors to explain what's supposed to be the perfect speech of a perfect being. Yep, I'm ready to take shahada. And this is going to bring me to my next point. But guys, remember, because it's live, it's a live stream, things happen beyond our control. So you're going to have to give me a second. This is just a warm-up. Are you prayed up? Are you asking the Spirit to fill us? Because I want to do two sessions. One, on refuting Islam. And a second session after this, if God wills, if the Lord wills, on Jesus being Jehovah in the flesh. Okay, but I got to just do something. This is a live stream. This is why I love live streams. Because you don't know what to expect in a live stream. So I have to step away real quickly. But I won't leave you without some entertainment. I will not leave you unentertained. I'm going to play a classic Assyrian song. Assyrian is the language of heaven, baby. Listen. In Jesus' name, I'll be right back. Woo!
See you, friend, Andrew. This is fair use. Fair use, okay? And it's part of my library of Assyrian music. Okay, this is, I forgot his name anyway. But anyway, with that said, now let's get into the second part of my discussion. Here's the link again. Guys, please click on the link because I'm going to follow the outline. Now I'm gonna just be reading from my article. Here is, oh, pray that the buffering goes away in Jesus' name. Please, my God, for your glory in Jesus' name. Oh boy, anyway, here's the link. Here's the link. I'm gonna pretty much be following the outline of my article. One of the greatest proofs that the Quran is a fraud, apart from chapter four, verse 82, which I just briefly touched upon, is the repeated assertion of the Quran. Now, follow with me, guys. This is where I'm going to need you to follow with me because we're going to have some fun. The Quran repeats over and over and over again that it is a per perspicuous book. I know that's a term that many people don't use anymore. Perspicuous means that it is a book that's clear, unambiguous, and it is a book that provides full exposition for everything, the Quran claims that it fully details, it details everything. It provides a full exposition of everything. Not some things, but everything, of all things. Now, follow, follow the article and thank Protestant believer. He's posting the verses. So I'm just going to follow the outline, but I'm not going to read every single verse. I'm going to read just... A select few. Chapter 6, verse 114. Chapter 6, verse 114. Say, O Muhammad, shall I seek a judge other than Allah, while it is he who has sent down unto you the book, explained in detail. Please, guys, in Jesus' name, understand the point, absorb the point, memorize these points. Memorize this point. The Quran repeatedly asserts, the Quran is a clear book, a perspicuous book, an unambiguous book that provides fully detailed exposition for everything. Okay, I'm going to sound like a broken record because it's got to sink in. Chapter 6, verse 126. Chapter 6, verse 126. And this is the path of your Lord leading straight. We have detailed our revelations detailed our revelations, right? Now, the last part of chapter 7, verse 32 of the Quran. The last part of this verse, because it's a lengthy verse, I'm going to skip to the last part. Chapter 7, verse 32. Thus, we have explained the ayat in detail. We've explained the verses in detail. Detailed exposition of the verses of the Quran. Chapter 7, verse 52. We have brought to them a book which we have explained in detail with knowledge. Let me repeat that verse again. Chapter 7, verse 52. We have brought to them a book, which we have explained in detail with knowledge. Now, before I read the rest of the passages, are you guys listening to the claim of the Quran? I just got to make sure you're following with me. Do you see that the Quran is repeating the assertion that this Quran provides fully detailed exposition of everything, fully detailed exposition of all of its verses, right? Because we're going to have so much fun. By the time I'm done with this session, you'll be shocked that Muslims actually leave this Quran. It is a miracle that, the, that Muslims think the Quran is a miracle. That's the miracle, that they think it's a miracle. When I'm done with this, you're going to sit back and say, I cannot believe there are people that are so blinded to believe in this man and his book. I, I, I promise you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll see it. 
chapter 7, verse 174. 7, verse 174. Thus do we explain the ayat in detail. Now, I'm going to skip to chapter 10, verse 37. Chapter 10, verse 37, right? This one, you really need to pay attention to this one. Let me read it. And this Quran is not such as could ever be produced by other than Allah, Lord of the heavens and the earth, but it is a confirmation of the revelation which was before it, i.e. the Torah, Torah, the Injil gospel. Here's the part. And a full explanation of the book, wherein there is no doubt from the Lord of the Alameen. Alameen, right? Rabbul Alameen. Okay? Here, let me, let me post that part again. And a full exposition of the book. You guys see it? And a full exposition of the book. Okay? You guys, indeed, in their stories, there's a lesson for men of understanding. It is not a forged statement, but a confirmation of Allah's existing books, right? The Torah, the Injil, other scriptures of Allah. And a detailed explanation of everything. And a guide and a mercy for the people who believe. And a detailed explanation of everything. Wow. Here you go. And a detailed explanation of everything. So I'm going to sound like a broken record until it sinks in. Folks, can I ask you a question? If the Quran says it is a book that provides a detailed explanation of everything, doesn't this clearly prove that the Quran is claiming you don't need anything other than the Quran to understand the Quran? So I'll make sure you're getting it. There it goes again. Isn't it crystal clear? That the Quran is claiming all you need is the Quran, you need nothing else. But let me now unpack the problem with this passage. Notice it doesn't qualify what the everything is. It simply says, and a detailed explanation of everything. Everything in existence is the Quran then claiming to provide detailed explanations for everything that exists so that we should find in the Quran detailed explanation of math of science and the various branches of science, like zoology, you know, botany, astrology, biology. Because note, it doesn't qualify what everything else is. It simply says a detailed explanation of everything. So not only don't you need anything other than the Quran to understand the Quran, you don't even need to go to university. You don't need to learn science. You don't need to go to grammar school. You don't need to learn astronomy or math from anyone other than the Quran. You catch it or no? And a detailed explanation of everything. It doesn't qualify what everything is. Everything in existence. That means I don't need to go to grammar school. I don't need to go to high school. I don't need to go to college. I don't need to go to university. All I need is a Quran because the Quran is going to tell me everything about everything in existence. Not only about God, not only about religion, but it's going to tell me about math and the various branches of math, like calculus and algebra and you know geometry and the various branches of science, like calculus and all of it, it's there, it's fully detailed. Detailed explanation of everything, folks. Right? Ah, but they'll say, no, 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 man. Everything is limited by the context of the Quran. And obviously the Quran is talking about religious matters. Oh, really? The last time I checked, you Muslims claim that the Quran contains scientific statements. So then why are you now limiting it to simply spiritual, religious, theological matters when you are the guys running to the Quran to use the Quran to prove that the Quran accurately foretells modern scientific discoveries? You can't have your cake and eat it too, my friend.
you catch it. If they, if they try to tell you, no, 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 it's just limited to religious, spiritual, theological matters. Last time I checked, you Muslims point to the Qur'an's statements on science as proof of its divine origin. So why now are you limiting it to theological, religious matters when you use the Qur'an to prove that the Qur'an accurately foretells modern scientific discoveries? You can't have your cake and eat it too, my friend. You get it now? But there's more. Let me read chapter 11, verse 1. Alif Lam Ra, chapter 11, verse 1. This is a book whose verses have been made firm and free from imperfection, and then they have been expounded in detail. Expounded in detail. Okay, folks, if the Quran says its verses, not some, its verses in general are expounded in detail, isn't this proof that the Quran is saying you don't need the tafsirs, you don't need the hadiths, you don't need Muhammad's explanation apart from the Quran? Here it is, chapter 11, verse 1. Alif Lam Ra. This is a book whose verses have been made firm and free from imperfection, and then they have been expounded in detail. But folks, did you know that this verse itself proves that the claim of this verse is a lie? This verse proves that the claim of this verse is a lie. Do you know why? Till this day, no Muslim can tell you what the letters Alif Lam Ra mean. Did you know that? Irony of ironies. The very verse, the very verse that says that the verses of the Quran are explained in detail is the very verse that contains three letters that no one till this day knows what they mean. Alif Lam Ra. Okay, chapter 11, verse 1. Can you now expound in date detail the meaning of Alif Lam Ra? Yep, A-L-R. These are the Arabic alphabets. Okay, wait, wait. Chapter 11, verse 1. Could you now explain to me what Alif Lam Ra mean? Because you just said that this Quran is a book whose verses have been made firm, free of imperfection, and have been expounded in detail. In detail. So now expound in detail for us what Alif Lam Ra mean. Sorry, guys, buffering badly. Can you guys hear me? Sorry. Like I said, internet connection not the best in Jesus' name. Right? You see how easy? Yeah, in Jesus' name, bless this session, Lord. Please, my God, in Jesus' name. Right? Ah, oh, internet. Anyway, you see how easy the trying God has made it to expose the fraud of Muhammad, to prove the Quran is a fraud and Muhammad is a false prophet, antichrist, son of Satan? Did it sink in that this verse itself refutes the claim of the verse? Alif Lam Ra. Don't take my word for it. Look at the commentaries and they'll tell you no interpretation has come to the map. Regarding their precise meaning. The Muslim scholars were all over the map regarding the precise meaning of these letters. And the commentators admit no tradition has come down from Muhammad explaining the meaning of these verses. So they have nothing on Muhammad's authority telling them what these letters mean. Explaining these letters. Do you know that? And the Muslim scholars are all over the map regarding the significance, the meaning of these letters. I hope it stopped lagging. Everything okay now? Before I move on, I just want to make sure. Okay. 
Isn't it ironic? The very verse that claims that the verses of the Quran are firm and free of imperfection is itself imperfect. Isn't it ironic? The very verse that claims the verses of the Quran are expounded in detail, firm and free of imperfection, is itself not detailed and imperfect. Yeah, Come on, I'm trying to knock that internet connection back into working order. Wow. We plead the blood of Jesus Christ to cover us from all attacks of the evil one. The brother makes a good point. All right. Hopefully it's working now. Okay. Chapter 16, verse 89 of the Quran. Chapter 16, verse 89. The brother makes a good point. Chapter 16, verse 89. I'm setting you up for what's to come. Chapter 16, verse 89. Okay, let's read it. One day we shall raise from all peoples a witness against them, from amongst themselves, and we shall bring thee as a witness against these thy people. And we have sent down to thee the book explaining all things. My goodness gracious. This book explains all things. This book explains all things. A guide of mercy and glad tidings to Muslims. Hmm. Explain all things. All right. I don't know if the connection's good up here. I'm by the router. Yep. So it's going to explain to you how to cook dinner. It's going to explain to you what temperature to cook turkey and chicken in the oven. It's going to explain to you, well, actually the Hadiths do, how much toilet paper to use, what toilet paper to buy, what bed sheets you should use, what pillows you should buy, and what you should avoid. And even the car, it's going to tell you what car you should buy, what gas you should use, because it explains all things. The brother makes a good point. You guys got it or no? Do you see what, what we're setting up Muhammad for and the disaster we're about to unleash on the Quran by the grace of the triune God? Okay, for the sake of time, I'm going to look at just two more verses. Well, one more. I was going to look at 3028. I'm going to look at, yeah, let me look at two more. Chapter 41, verse 3. Chapter 41, verse 3. Saw my paper, my article. Okay, here you go. 41 verse 3, a book whereof the verses are explained in detail. A Quran in Arabic for people who know. Let me repeat it again. A book whereof the verses are explained in detail. A Quran in Arabic for people who know. Do you see the repeated emphasis of the Quran over and over again? This Quran is plain Arabic, clear Arabic. This Quran is a book containing verses that are firm, perfect, fully detailed. An exposition of all things. An exposition of everything. Right? The brother makes a good point. Okay. Now let me give you an alternate translation of this text. That was Halali Khan. Here's Rashad Khalifa. Look how he translates this. Rashad Khalifa. A scripture whose verses provide the complete details. In an Arabic Quran for people who know. A scripture whose verses provide the complete details in an Arabic Quran for people who know. Oh, my goodness. The brother makes a good point. Finally, chapter 44, verse 2. Chapter 44, verse 2. Al-Ali Khan. All of this is in the article. I'm going to give the link again. I'll put the link to the article in the description box when I'm finished, Lord Jesus willing. 44, verse 2. By the manifest book. This Quran that makes things clear. By the manifest book, this Quran that makes these things clear. Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue to refute this religion for your glory and the power of the Holy Spirit and bless your people, Lord. By the manifest book, this Quran that makes things clear. All right. Are we all now on the same page? Did you get the point? And we, we asked the Lord Jesus, bless this connection. Because we don't want to start buffering. Because now it's going to get juicy. 
Did it now sink in? And here's the link to the article, folks. The link to the article. If you study these arguments and memorize them and use them, I promise you, this is a promise. No Muslim can give you an honest, a factually sound refutation. He'll tap dance, lie, right? He'll tap dance and lie, but he or she cannot give you a sound, honest, factual refutation. He can lie, he can distort, he can deceive, but he can't give you an honest rebuttal. If you memorize these arguments and use it for the glory of Christ. Okay? Here's the link again to the article. Clear? Okay. Now, let's have some fun. Let's go to chapter 3, verse 7 of the Quran. But Muslims don't know that. We need to convince them that. But it's not about what you know. It's about you being used of the Holy Spirit to share this with Muslims to get saved. Chapter 3, verse 7. Now, Protestant, you can post it. Chapter 3, verse 7. Three verse seven. I think Protestant left this behind. Okay. Read with me. Nightmare number one. Nightmare number one. Chapter three, verse seven. He it is who hath revealed unto thee, Muhammad, the scripture wherein are clear revelations. They are the mother of the book, literally mother of the book, not substance of the book, and others which are allegorical. Okay. You're giving me a watered-down translation of chapter 3, verse 7. It's not your fault. It's the Quran that you're using. That It's the fault of Pictal. Let me get you a better one. Hold on. You're giving me a less than accurate verse, uh, translation. Hold on, folks. Let me get it. This is the problem with the various translations of the Quran. Okay. I'm going to use... Pickthal, uh, Arbery, I'm sorry. Let's use Arbery. Here's Arbery. Chapter 3, verse 7, Arbery. It is he who sent down upon thee the book, wherein are verses clear that are the essence of the book. The Arabic doesn't say essence of the book. It says Umul Kitab, the mother of the book. Others, ambiguous. As for those in whose heart is swerving, they follow the ambiguous part. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait, okay, hold on. Hold your horses, time out. Chapter 3, verse 7 says, there are two sets of passages in the Quran. Clear passages, and they are the mother of the book, Um al-Kitab. But then there are passages that are ambigu ambiguous. And those whose hearts are diseased, swervering, full of doubt, focus on the ambiguous part of the Quran. Wait, I'm confused, folks. Didn't we just read verse after verse after verse that says the Quran is a book that contains verses that are fully detailed? Didn't we just read verse after verse after verse the Quran saying this is a book that provides full exposition of everything, fully details all things, everything? Wait, 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 I'm confused. But this, this Quran says, it is he who sent down upon thee the book wherein our verses clear that are the mother of the book. Others ambiguous. Wait, how can you have any verse that's ambiguous when verse after verse that I just cited, that's in the article, state plainly that the Quran is a book that provides a full exposition of all things, of everything. This Quran contains verses that are fully detailed. Do I need to repeat those passages again? But let's read the second part of the verse. Oh, my goodness. Watch here. Second part of the verse. Okay. Watch here. Read with me. 
And those whose hearts are swerve, swerving focus on the ambiguous part, desiring dissension and desiring its interpretation. So those whose hearts are diseased focus on the unclear verses, wanting to know its meaning. Now notice what the passage goes on to say. And none knows its interpretation save only God. None know the interpretation of these ambiguous verses except God. And those firmly rooted in knowledge say, we believe in it, all is from our Lord, yet none remembers but men possessed of minds. Okay, now I'm really confused. I'm really confused. No one knows what those ambiguous verses mean except Allah, even though Allah said in the Quran, this book explains everything, explains all things, provides full exposition of its verses, not some of them. So let me raise two questions. Number one, why in the world did Allah reveal ambiguous verses whose interpretation are known only to him when those verses do not benefit anyone? Why in the world would this all-wise deity send down verses that no one knows what they mean when the Quran is supposed to be a book of guidance in clear Arabic for those who know Arabic and yet here we find passages that are actually misguiding people because they want to know what it means because they believed what these other verses say. They've taken Muhammad at his word when Muhammad said, this book explains everything. The verses in this book are firm, are perfect, and are fully detailed. Okay, Muhammad, then we want to know what these passages mean. Oh, sorry, you can't know what they mean. Only unknown knows what they mean because they're ambiguous. But wait, you just told us your book explains everything, all things. The verses are fully detailed. How in the world can you have passages that only Allah knows what they mean if this book is supposed to be clear to us who speak Arabic? So why did your God send down these verses, Muhammad? What benefit to us for your God to send verses that no one knows what they mean. So if no one knows what they mean, why are they there? Why does he want us to read it? What's the purpose of reading these unclear passages? Please, Muhammad, help me understand. You guys getting it or no? You guys getting it or no? The second problem, you want to know what the second problem is? Do you want to know what the second problem with this passage is? Okay, here's the second problem. Did you know that this verse itself is unclear? Did you know that this verse itself is unclear? This verse was read in two ways. There were two variants to this passage. Did you know that? Angela's laughing. <laughs> Remember, according to the Islamic tradition, the Quran was revealed in seven letters to Muhammad, which to this day, no one knows what Muhammad meant when he said the Quran was given to him in seven letters. This passage has two major variant readings. The one that you just read, it says, those whose hearts are swerving focus on the ambiguous parts Desiring to know its interpretation. Yet no one knows its interpretation except Allah. And those possessed of knowledge say we believe in all of it. That's one reading. Did you know what the other reading says? The other reading says this. Those whose hearts are swerving focus on the ambiguous part desiring its interpretation. Yet none knows its interpretation except Allah and those who possess knowledge. Okay, now I'm confused. Does the verse say, no one knows what these verses mean except Allah? And only Allah? And those who possess knowledge believe in all of it, even those verses they don't understand? Or does the verse say, 
No one knows what these verses mean except Allah and those who possess knowledge. Even this verse is unclear as to its actual precise interpretation. Okay, I'm, I'm baffled now. Can you guys help me? I'm really baffled. Okay, can you help me? I'm baffled. I really am. Does chapter 3, verse 7 actually say, no one knows the interpretation of the ambiguous parts except Allah and only Allah? Or does chapter 3, verse 7 actually say, no one knows the meaning, the interpretation of the ambiguous verses except Allah and those who possess knowledge? I'm really confused. Now let me add some more problems. Let me add a third problem. You know what the third problem is to this verse? The third problem? The third problem is that the Quran is supposed to be the speech of Allah. Perfect, eternal, uncreated. So you actually want me to believe that part of Allah's uncreated speech contains ambiguous, unclear speech, impugning your God's ability to speak clearly. So that means in eternity before creation, a part of Allah's speech was nothing other than unclear, unintelligible, ambiguous babble. So that you're now impugning your God because you're accusing your God of speaking less than clearly because some parts of his speech are ambiguous, unclear, and unintelligible so that your God, his speech includes incoherent babble. You get it? Are you guys getting it or no? If you're not getting it, put it too. But if you're getting it, sort of truth, everyone else, my brothers, sisters in Christ, I'm here to serve you, to be used of the Spirit, to make you warriors for the King of glory, Jesus. The fourth part, the fourth problem with this, I don't know, Lightning Samurai, I don't believe you're not getting it. You're just playing dumb because I think you're a Mohammedan. If you're serious, let me know. If you guys look, if you're playing games, I'm going to block you. Play games with me and see how you get blocked. I'm talking about people who are serious. The fourth problem, the fourth problem with this passage, right, is that the Quran says that the clear verses, the clear verses of the Quran are the mother of the book. The Arabic is Umul Kitab. Umul Kitab, the mother of the book. Here you go. Let me give you a little translation of the Arabic. Okay, hold on. Here you go. He it is who has revealed to thee the book of which there are some verses that are decisive. They are the mother of the book and others ambiguous. They are the mother of the book. Okay, guys, follow with me. We're going to have fun here. Okay, mother of the book. And in case you don't believe me, the word is mother of the book. Here's the Arabic in transliteration. Umul Kitab. Umul Kitab. Folks, did you know if you read the sound hadith like Bukhari Muslim? And don't take my word for it. Go to sunnah.com and type in Fatiha. F-A-T-I-H-A. -A. The first chapter of the Quran is called Surat Al-Fatiha, the chapter of the opening. Surat, Surat Al-Fatiha. And it's seven verses. Did you know, according to Muhammad, you know what Umm Al-Kitab is, the mother of the book? It's chapter one of the Quran. In Sal Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Muhammad says, chapter one of the Quran is the mother of the book, Umm Al-Kitab. Umm Al-Kitab. Folks, you know what that means? According to Muhammad, only seven verses are clear because he just called Surah Al-Fatiha, chapter one, Surah one, which consists of only seven verses. He called that chapter 
Um al-Kitab, the mother of the book. And yet the Quran contains over 6,000 verses, but according to Muhammad, it's only chapter 1 that's the mother of the book. And chapter 1 is only 7 verses. So wait, Muhammad, you're telling me that the clear verses are 7 verses because you just called chapter 1, Surah Al-Fatah, Um Al-Kitab, the mother of the book, and yet chapter 3, verse 7 says, the clear verses are the mother of the book, and those clear verses are chapter 1 of the Quran, only 7 out of over 6,000, only 7 are clear? Really? Really? Some of you guys are skeptics. Let me get it for you. I'm sorry. Let me find it here. Here you go. Here's the link. Let's read it. Here's the link. There you go. Sunnah.com. And it's in Sunan Ibn, Ma Ibn Majah. And it's Sahih. This is also found in Bukhari and Muslim. But I just did a search, just real for the sake of time. And God willing, I'll include it in part two of my post. This is the Quran, the God's word. Okay, here you go. Click on it. Let me read it. This is from Sunan Ibn Majah, establishing the prayer and the Sunnah regarding them. The grade is Sahih. Volume 1, Book 5, Hadith 838. The messenger of Allah said, whoever performs a prayer in which he does not recite Umul Quran, the mother of the Quran, i.e. Al-Fatiha, it is deficient, not complete. I said, oh, Abu Huraira, sometimes I am behind the imam. He pressed my forearm and said, oh, Persian, recite it to yourself. Let's see if I can find you another one so you guys know I'm not making it up. Okay. Let's see if I can find you another one so you know, because you know you guys, you're all skeptics, dude. Yep. Let me see if I find another one. And it's saying in a long run. All right, let's see. Mulai be. For you. Just want to double check. Sorry, guys. I'll include in part one of my paper, God willing. Umul right. Quran. Yep, Fatiha. Let me just find where it says it. Okay. Just bear with me, folks. Okay. Yep. Let me let me find it. Okay. Let me see. Yeah, maybe I'll find it now. Let's try. La, 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 la. Bear with me, folks. It's what happens when you go live. I'll have it in part two. I just want to find it. Yep, here it goes. Okay, let me get it. I found one. Umul Kitab in the seven offer here. Okay, here you go. Here you go. It's talking about Surah Al-Fatiha. Here you go, Hassan. So guys, bear with me. Remember, when you do live stream, sometimes you got to do stuff right on, on the spot, impromptu. Sunan Ibn Majah again. This great Hassan. Now, this is also in Bukhari Muslim, but again, I'm searching right now live. So you know I'm not making it up. I gave you the link. It's sunnah.com. It was narrated that Aisha said, I heard the Messenger of Allah say, every prayer in which... The Umul Kitab, the mother of the book, is not recited, is deficient. And in the context of this section, it's talking about Surah Al-Fatiha. Did you see he calls it Umul Kitab? Right? Umul Kitab. Okay, now, folks, according to Muhammad, chapter on the Quran, Surah Al-Fatiha, seven verses, those seven verses are the mother of the book, Umm al-Kitab. Chapter 3, verse 7 of the Quran says, the clear verses are the mother of the book, 
Umul Kitab. But the clear verses are only seven, according to Muhammad in the Hadith, chapter one, Surah Al Fatiha. So you're, you mean to tell me out of over 6,000 verses, only seven are clear? Wow. Wow. Only seven are clear. I get it now. I get it, buddy. So what do we learn thus far? And I'm just, this is just beginning. The Quran repeatedly states it is a book that explains everything, all things, not some things. It is, it is a book in which its verses are fully detailed, a full exposition of its verses, right? Implication, you don't need anything besides the Quran to understand the Quran. And yet we just saw that chapter 3, verse 7 contradicts the repeated assertion of the Quran that all of its verses, everything in the Quran are fully detailed, fully explained in clear Arabic, for those who know, because the Quran in 3, 7 says some verses are ambiguous and only Allah knows what it means. And even that verse is debatable regarding its precise interpretation. My goodness. This is why I say the real miracle of the Quran is that people think it's a miracle. The real miracle of the Quran is that people think it's a miracle. Right? So far, are you with me? Because now we're going to go into some meteor objections. Weightier objections. Objections that's going to make you laugh and stand in shock. How in the world could anyone believe this garbage, this nonsense, this incoherent babble that is full of such wicked, immoral, filthy teaching? Okay. You ready? Okay. One thing I want to teach every one of you guys. Here's what I want to teach every one of you guys. Do not let Muslims get away with assuming the biblical narrative to make sense out of the Quran. Please now, here's where I need your ears by the power of the Holy Spirit. Sit tight, full attention, because now you're going to see where the nightmare is going to begin for Muslims. When you're witnessing to Muslims, do not let them assume the biblical narrative to make sense out of the Quran. What do I mean? We fall for this trap and we do it often. We let Muslims refer to biblical characters mentioned in the Quran and tell us things about those characters that the Quran nowhere specifies because they're assuming the biblical narrative, what the Bible says to fill out the details. So are you now ready with me to journey with me, embark with me on a path to show that the Quran is the greatest proof that Muhammad is a fraud and antichrist and that the Quran needs the Bible in order to make sense out of its contents. And yet the Bible condemns the Quran as a book of deception, a book of the evil one. Are you now ready? You sure you're ready? It's all my paper. Okay. Number one, ask the Muslims, who is the mother of Ishmael? Who is the mother of Ishmael? This is all in my article. Who is the mother of Ishmael? You know what they're going to tell you? They're going to tell you Hagar. Here's the response. You say, lightning samurai, show me a verse in the Quran where it says Hagar is the mother of Ishmael and show me a verse in the Quran where it says Abraham had more than one wife. See, light, lightning samurai, I think he's a Mohammedan, a stone smoocher. So I want him now to defend Muhammad. Lightning samurai, show me your lightning, your thunder. Show me a verse in the Quran. Can you send Maghrib on his merry way? Okay. Show me a verse in the Quran where it says Abraham had more than one wife and that Hagar is the mother of Ishmael. Okay, I'm sorry, Lightning, because you, you were answering. I thought you were answering as a Muslim, a Mohammedan. Do you know what, folks? 
The Quran nowhere mentions that, that Abraham had more than one wife. It doesn't even mention the name of Abraham's wives. It doesn't even mention the name of Sarah, let alone Hagar. And nowhere does the Quran specify that Ishmael is the son of someone other than the mother of Isaac. You don't believe me? Let me show you. Let's go back to my article so you can see this for yourself. So do not let them get away with presupposing the biblical narrative to make sense out of their book of deception and porn. There you go. If you go to the section, I have three sections in part one. Forget the section where it says who exactly is Gabriel. Let's skip to the section. The subsection are Ishmael, Isaac, and Jacob, brothers or sons of one another. If you go there, let me read. I can't post it. It's lengthy. Chapter 11, verses 69 to 71. And our messengers came unto Abraham with good news. Chapter 11, 69 to 71. They said, peace. He answered, peace. And delayed not to bring a roasted calf. And when he saw their hands, reached not to, to it. They didn't eat it. He mistrusted them and conceived a fear of them. So he got afraid of them. He didn't know they were angels. They said, fear not, lo, we are sent unto the folk of Lot. And his wife, standing by, laughed when we gave her good tidings of the birth of Isaac and after Isaac of Jacob. Did you guys catch it? The only wife that the Quran re refers to, the wife of Abraham that the Quran mentions, not even by name, the only wife of Abraham that the Quran alludes to, refers to, even though it doesn't mention her name, is the mother of Isaac. Is the mother of Isaac. So, challenge to the Mohammedans. Show me where the Quran says that Ishmael is the son of Hagar and that Abraham had more than one wife. Show me. Now, they'll tell you, we don't need to show you. They'll say, we don't need to show you. Yes, you do. You know why? Because your Quran says it is a book that's fully detailed. It explains everything, all things, and it fully details its verses. The moment you leave the Quran and go to my Bible to fill in the details, you destroy Muhammad as a fraud and prove the Quran is a lie. The moment you go to the Hadiths and quote Bukhari and Muslim, you prove the Quran is a lie, full of errors, and Muhammad is a fraud, because the verses we cited clearly stated, this book provides a full exposition of all things. It explains everything, the verses in which are fully detailed. Such a claim means you cannot go outside of the Quran you cannot quote the Bible or the Hadith to fill in the details because the Quran says it explains everything. You with me there? Now, here's my question to the Christians. And I'll, I'll end it with this and I'll do a part two on is the Quran God's word? And Lord willing, I'll do another session after this on Jesus being Jehovah, if you guys are interested. Here's my question to the Christians. Are Ishmael and Isaac brothers, or is Ishmael the father of Isaac? Are Ishmael and Isaac brothers, or is Ishmael the father of Isaac? Christians, answer that. Um, this is the Christians. Brothers, right? Brah. Okay. Isaac and Jacob, are they brothers or is Isaac the father of Jacob? Isaac and Jacob, are they brothers or is Isaac the father of Jacob? Are you sure Peter and King of Kings, Isaac and Jacob are brothers? Hello? Okay, so notice, Ishmael and Isaac are brothers, but Isaac is the father of Jacob, right? Ishmael 
and Isaac are brothers, but Isaac is the father of Jacob, right? Do you know that according to the Quran, the Quran doesn't know the exact relationship between Ishmael, Isaac, and Jacob? The Quran has no clue what the exact relationship of Ishmael, Isaac, and Jacob happened to be? Did you know that? That if you read the Quran carefully, you either end up with Ishmael being the father of Isaac, like he's the father of Jacob, or Jacob is the brother of Isaac, like Isaac is the brother of Ishmael, if you just follow the Quran. And this is in my article again, and you don't believe me? Here, here you go. Let me click on it, and then if Protestant wants to quote, let him do it. I'll read it out loud for you. Here you go, because I even provide the Arabic. Chapter 14, verse 39. This one I think I can quote. Chapter 14, verse 39. Chapter 14, verse 39. Here you go. Read with me. Praise be told. This is supposedly Abraham praying. Abraham is supposedly praying. Ibrahim, alayhi salam, like the Muslims would say. Notice what he says. Praise be to Allah who hath given wahabba, wahabba, given me in my old age, Ishmael and Isaac. Lo, my Lord is indeed the hero of prayer. Now, when you read it as a Christian, you understand this to mean that God gave Abraham two sons, right? Ishmael and Isaac, correct? God gave Abraham two sons, right? Ishmael and Isaac, correct? But notice it doesn't tell us that God gave Abraham, Ishmael, and Isaac from two different women, right? It doesn't even tell you they're from two different women. You don't know if they have the same mother or different mothers, right? <laughs> okay, now, with this said, okay, pay attention now. Abraham says, Allah gave me, Wahabba gave me Ishmael and Isaac, two sons. Ah, now it's going to get fun. Chapter 6, verse 83 to 84 of the Quran. Chapter 6, verse 83 to 84 of the Quran. I don't know if Protestant is still here. Pay attention now. That's verse 83. I'm going to post it once. Okay. And here's 84. Let's see if you guys catch the incoherent babble of the Quran. Okay. Read with me. 683 to 84. That is our argument, which we bestowed upon Abraham as against his people. We're, we raise up in degrees whom we will. Surely thy Lord is all wise, all knowing. And we gave, same Arabic word, right? Wahabna, Wahabna. We gave to him Isaac and Jacob. Okay, folks, I'm confused. Chapter 1439 says, Allah gave Abraham, Ishmael, and Isaac. In chapter 6, verse 84, the Quran says, Allah gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What in the world does that mean? When it says, we gave Abraham, Ishmael, and Isaac, it means two sons. But here it says, we gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Does that mean Jacob is the other son of Abraham? So that Ishmael, Isaac, and Jacob are three brothers? Because they are the three sons that Allah gave to Abraham. And how does the Muslim know using the Quran only? Did you catch it? Let me repeat it again. Let me repeat it again. 1439. Allah gave Abraham, Ishmael, and Isaac. Well, those were two sons, so they're brothers. 684, Allah gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Wait, same Arabic word, gave. Is the relationship the same? We know Ishmael and Isaac, Isaac were two sons given to Abraham. But here it says Isaac and Jacob were given to Abraham. Implication, is Jacob the other son of Abraham? If a Muslim says no, how does he know? If the Muslim says no, he gave him Isaac and then later his grandson Jacob, how do you know? Where does the Quran say that? From the Quran, show me. From the Quran, show me Jacob is not the son of Abraham and the brother of Isaac. So you either end up with Allah gave Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, and Jacob. So there are three brothers. Or you're going to have to say 
Like Isaac is the father of Jacob, so Abraham was given Ishmael, who then fathered Isaac, who then fathered Jacob. So Ishmael is the father of Isaac, and Isaac is the father of Jacob, or they're all three brothers. How do you know? Using just the Quran. How do you know? What's the answer, Muslims? The moment you use the Bible, you destroy Muhammad and the Quran because the Quran says this book contains verses that are fully detailed. This book contains verses that are firm and perfect and provides fully detailed exposition of everything, of all things, meaning I don't need the Bible or the Hadith. All I need is the Quran. You with me there? 1949, chapter 19, verse 49. Same Arabic term used again. Thank you, Protestant, my brother. So when we had withdrawn from them and that which they were worshiping beside Allah, we gave him. Context is Abraham. Wahabna. It's the same Arabic verb. Isaac and Jacob. So Muslims, please help me understand. One verse, 14 through 9, says Allah gave Abraham, Ishmael, and Isaac, two sons. Chapter 6, verse 84, and chapter 19, verse 49, says Allah gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Are they also brothers? So that Jacob is the third son that Allah gave to Abraham? If you say no, how do you know? If you're going to tell me no, it means that Allah gave Abraham, Isaac, and Isaac's seed, Abraham's grandson, then when the same language is used for Ishmael and Isaac, how do you know that doesn't mean that Ishmael is the father of Isaac like Isaac's the father of Jacob? How do you know? Absolutely, Sargun David. That's the point. The author or authors, if it's not Muhammad, was parroting. Stories that he picked up orally, garbled it up, messed it up, jumbled it up, and made it part of the Quran. The same Quran that Muhammad claimed, or those who produced the Quran, is fully detailed, explains everything in detail, so you need nothing. And yet here you see, Sargun David, the Quran makes no sense apart from the Bible. But if you use the Bible, that means the Quran is a lie, it's a fraud, proving Muhammad is a false prophet. And the Bible, in its present form which is the same form that the Jews and Christians had access to, they're reading the same Bible we read today, condemns the Quran because the Quran contradicts the core teachings of the Bible. Damn if you do, damn if you don't. You're damned if you appeal to the Bible. You're damned if you don't appeal to the Bible. Oh, you think it's bad? Do you really want to laugh? Do you really want to laugh and be shocked at how incoherent, stupid, unintelligible the Quran truly is? Apart from being a book full of evil and murder and filth and porn, a grossly immoral book, put it aside. Did you know the Quran says that Isaac and Jacob were given to Lot? Let me repeat it again. I don't think you heard it. The Quran says Isaac and Jacob were given to Lot. Yep. Click on my article. Protestant Believer just posted it. I can't post all of it. Sorry. Here's my article again. We're almost done. Yep, yep, yep. You guys didn't think I want... Wait, hold on. Second, you don't believe me, right? Here you go. Click on the article. Go to that section. As Protestant Believer, post the verse. It's chapter 29, 26 to 27. Pay attention to the subject of the pronouns, pronouns he and him. Please don't take my word for it. Read it. Chapter 29, verses 26 to 27. 26 to 27. Pay attention to the pronouns he and him. Note it. I'm going to read. But Lot believed him. And he said, but Lot believed him. And he said, I will flee to my Lord. He's the Almighty, the All Wise. And we gave him 
the nearest antecedent to him is Lot, because he was the one mentioned previously. We gave him Isaac and Jacob, and we appointed the prophecy in the book to be among his seed. Whose seed? Lot's seed. And we gave him his wage in this world and the world to come. He shall be among the righteous. And then again, it refers to him. And Lot, when he said to his people, surely you commit such indecency as never any being in all the world committed before you. Wow. Wow. Protestant believer just posted it. Follow the pronouns carefully. There is no change in the object, the subject of the pronouns. It's referring to Lot. And it says, we gave Lot, Isaac and Jacob, and we established the prophethood among Lot's seed. But wait, Lot fathered the Ammonites and the Moabites. So you're saying the prophets come from the Ammonites and the Moabites? Or are you saying Lot is the true father of Israel? Look at Biryani, the joke. He can't answer any of my objections, so he's now preaching a sermon. So, folks, I'm confused. Did Allah give Lot, Isaac, and Jacob and establish the prophethood among Lot's seed? Or did Allah give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the same way he gave Abraham, Ishmael, and Isaac? If he gave Isaac and Jacob to Abraham, like he gave Ishmael and Isaac to Abraham, does that mean Ishmael, Isaac, and Jacob are three sons given to Abraham so that Ishmael, Isaac, and Jacob are brothers? Or should we assume that in the case of Isaac, who's the father of Jacob, this proves that Ishmael is, uh, must also be the father of Isaac? Ishmael fathered Isaac, who fathered Jacob, so that God gave Abraham Ishmael, Ishmael's son Isaac, and Isaac's son Jacob. How do we know? How do we know? Did it sink in? I'm giving you guys a moment to sink in. Could it be any clearer that the Quran is a book of incoherent babble, incoherent, unintelligible, full of errors, full of discrepancies, and that it doesn't make sense if you don't have recourse to the Bible or the Hadiths. If that's clear, let me end it with the section on Adam and Eve in my paper. Now, before I move on, does anyone have any questions on the material that we've discussed thus far? Thus far. Yeah, and thank you, I for Christ. Notice this is the same book that says that Mary is the sister of Aaron, the daughter of Imran, and that Mary's mother is the wife of Imran, and yet the only sister of Aaron and daughter of Imran, according to the Bible, is Amram, the father of Moses. So according to the Quran, Moses is Jesus' maternal uncle. According to the Quran, Lot was given Abraham, I'm sorry, Isaac and Jacob. According to the Quran, Lot was given Isaac and Jacob. According to the Quran, Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob were given to Abraham, which either means they are three brothers, the three sons of Abraham, or Ishmael is the father of Isaac, like Isaac is the father of Jacob. Okay, finally, final section, final section. Let me give you the link to my article again. I love what Anna Groen, Groen said. How many Muslims have read this per excuse of a book? <laughs> I love that comment, sister. All right. Okay, now, Muslims, if you're listening, what is the name of Adam's wife? What is the name of Adam's wife? You know what they're going to tell you? Eve. Show me a single place in the Quran where it says Adam's wife's name is Eve. Show that to me. Show me in the Quran where the name of Adam's wife is given. 
Muslims, what are the name of Adam's first two sons, one of whom killed the other? What are the names of the first two sons, one of whom killed the other? Now, if they speak Arabic, they'll tell you Kabil and Habil. Kabil and Habil. Show me a single verse in the entire Quran where the two sons of Adam are named. Where does the Quran tell us their names? And here's what's funny. Here's what's funny. Does Kabil correspond to Cain? Now, I can see how Habil corresponds to Abel, but for the life of me, where do you get Cable from the name Cain? The Hadith and Islamic sources say Cain's name was Kabil. Habil and Kabil. Kabil and Habil. Can someone explain to me where in the world do you get Kabil from Cain? Where do you get Kabil from Cain? Can someone help me there? But again, it shows you that the author, authors of the Quran, if it wasn't Muhammad, was so silly that he wanted the names to rhyme. So if he calls Abel Habil, then Cain's got to be Kabil. Kabil and Habil. So he sacrificed the name of Cain, or the Arabic form of his name, in order to make the name rhyme with Habib. And this comes from Allah. The all-knowing Allah chose to give the wrong name, the wrong form of Cain's name in Arabic because he insisted that Cain's name has to rhyme with Habib. <laughs> they believe this, this religion is from God. Come on, man. Are you serious? Are you serious? You're telling me that your God chose to butcher the Arabic form of Cain's name because he was more interested in having these names rhyme. By golly, I like Kabil, so I'm going to call his brother Kabil. So Muhammad, I'm going to send you Wahi so that you won't include this in the Quran because the Quran is in Korean Babel. But you'll include in the Hadith, call him Kabil because it sounds a lot like Habil. Kabil, here's your brother Habil. Habil, here's your brother Kabil. Right? Apart from the fact that the Quran does not give you the names of the sons of Adam, the one who killed the other, let's look at the story nonetheless. Chapter 5 of the Quran, verses 27, right? All the way to 32. But Marian, though Cain is older than Abel, Allah changed the name of the older to correspond to the younger. He didn't change Abel's name to correspond to Cain. He changed Cain's name in Arabic to correspond to Abel. And they'll say, well, why not? All throughout the Bible, God chooses the younger over the older. Right? He chose Jacob over Esau, Isaac over Ishmael, Joseph over the others. So, of course, he preferred Habil's name over Cain. So, Cain, your name in Arabic is Kabil. Get over it. Live with it. Nee, 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 nee. <laughs> right? Okay. Lana, let's read the story. Here's my article, and we're going to be done with part one. We're going to be done with part one, God willing, and we'll, we'll do a session on Jesus' deity. If you guys promise to come back, if you want it, if you're too tired, we'll do it tomorrow, God willing. Let's see. Okay, there's the article. Go to the last section of the article. What about Adam? Let me read it. And a Protestant believer wants to quote it. Go ahead, brother. It's lengthy because I want to focus on 529. Apart from the fact that this story nowhere resembles the Genesis account, and I'll talk about where Muhammad got these varying details from, Lord willing, in the next session. Brother makes a good point. Brother makes a good point. Let's read. Because I want you to read 529. Recite to them the truth of the story of the two sons of Adam. What are their names? Wait, Quran, aren't you supposed to be a book that contains verses that are fully detailed? A book that 
explains all things in detail, a full exposition of everything, yes. So what are the names of the two sons of Adam? Oh, I forgot those details. Oh, okay. Okay. Recite to them the truth of the two, the story of the two sons of Adam. Behold, they each presented a sacrifice to God. Uh, they each presented a sacrifice. Was it the same sacrifice or were the sacrifices different? Oh, I forgot to include that detail as well. Oh, really? Yeah. Oops. Even though I said this Quran is a book that contains verses that are fully detailed, I forgot to mention whether they all, both offered the same sacrifice or were the sacrifices different. Oops. There it is. Oops, there it is, okay? It was accepted from one, but not from the other. Said the latter, be sure I will slay thee. Wait, wait, wait. You mean that the unnamed brother told the unnamed brother, I will kill thee, making known his intention? And that unnamed brother who was told that his unnamed brother would kill him did nothing to protect himself or guard himself? Surely, said the former, God doth accept of the sacrifice of those who are righteous. Oh, that was his response? But wait, who's the former and the latter? Are you saying the younger threatened to kill the older? Because last time I checked, latter means the one that came later. Former means the one who came first. So wait, the implication of the story is the younger... Is Cain? Wait, 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 guys. Am I getting it right? Last time I checked, when you say ladder, doesn't ladder mean the one who comes later? Can you help me out? Maybe I'm, I'm dumb in English. But you don't know Arabic, brother. The brother makes a good point. And it says the former. Last time I checked, former means the one who's before. So the younger threatened to kill... The younger threatened to kill the older? Is that what it's saying here? Hmm. Oh, but brother, you're basing it on a translation. Okay, all right. Okay. I'm sorry. Hold on. Let's see something. The more you study the Quran, the more you get baffled. The latter. But wait, friends. The Arabic for ladder is al akhari al akhari al akhari uh, guys i thought al akhari means later 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 so it does say the latter al akhari said the latter one said Wait, if the latter one said, I will kill thee, and the latter means the one who comes later, guys, did you see that the Quran actually says it's Habil who killed Kabil? Do you guys see it? Do you see it? I'm really confused. Wait, 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 wait. Come on. You're reading too much. Min al akhari. Allah, the latter one said, right? Hmm. If the latter one said it, that means the younger one threatened to kill the older one. It's right there. That's the Arabic. Anyway, so let's read. Surely said the former, God doth accept of the sacrifice of those who are righteous. If thou dost stretch thy hand against me to slay me, it is not for me to stretch my hand against thee to slay thee. For I do fear God, the cherisher of the worlds. Now here's the part I want you to catch. This is verse 29. For me, I intend to let thee draw on thyself my sin as well as thine, for thou wilt be among the companions of the fire, and that is the reward of those who do wrong. Did you catch what he said? I'm going to let you kill me, because when you kill me, my sins will be imputed to you. 
My sins will be imputed to you. So guess what, folks? Chapter 5, verse 29 of the Quran confirms that Allah will impute the sins of a person upon another. I will let you draw my sins upon you so that you will suffer for my sins and your sins. That's what the Arabic says. Be careful of those English translations that butcher the Arabic. Wow! So the Quran does confirm that Allah will punish someone for the sins committed by another. 529. It's right there in front of your eyes. Right? Now let's continue reading. The selfish soul of the other led him to the murder of his brother. He murdered him, and he became himself one of the lost ones. Then God sent a raven who scratched the ground to, to show him how to hide the shame of his brother. What was me, said he? Was I not even able to be as this raven and to hide the shame of my brother? Then he became full of regrets. Hmm. Now, folks, based on this passage alone, can you tell me what the name of the two sons of Adam are? Can you tell me who killed who? Can you tell me if their sacrifices were different or they both offered a sacrifice that was the same? And isn't it true that the plain reading of the passage says that the latter one, the younger one, killed the older one? So just reading the Quran, I'm left with the impression the younger killed the older. I don't know what their names are. I don't know if their sacrifices were different. And I also learned from 529 that Allah will impute the sins of the righteous upon the wicked, punishing the wicked for their sins and the sins of others. All of this from the Quran that's supposed to be fully detailed, explaining everything and all things. The real miracle of the Quran is that people think it's a miracle. Now, with that said, God willing, I'm done with part one. Lord willing, I plan to do an ongoing series destroying Muhammad and the Quran by the power of the triune God so Muslims will see the fraud of Muhammad, that he's an antichrist, and that the God of the Bible is the true God, and the Bible is his word, so that they will have the chance to hear information that their scholars will never tell them with the hopes that the Holy Spirit will use these meager efforts to open their hearts and minds to fall in love with the true Jesus, their only hope of salvation in Jesus' name. Now, here's the link to the article. Folks, do you want me to do another session, if the Lord is pleased, on the glory of Jesus in the book of Isaiah? You guys want me to do another one? Okay, it's now 3.43 p.m. my time. So it's 5.43 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I will start at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. So God willing, I'll go live in an hour and 15 minutes. Yep. So we're going to do 6 p.m. Illinois time. Is that all right? An hour, 15 minutes, because I need a break. So Lord Jesus, yep, Tom and Sargon. If you're here, hook up with me. Lord Jesus willing, I'll see you in an hour and 15 minutes. Okay? Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. Fill us for your glory. Wash us in your blood, Lord Jesus. Save us from our flesh. Save us from Satan and the world. Save our loved ones. Save my daughters. Provide for me and them. Please, Lord Jesus. See you, Lord willing, in an hour and 15 minutes. Lord willing.